Please join me in prayer. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God, our wisdom, our salvation. I don't know if you've ever watched or been to a fashion show. It's not my thing. But sometimes I see them on TV, and some of them are interesting with the latest fashions. Some of them, I see what some of them are wearing, and I think, okay, now who would buy that? But the fashion world is a multi-billion dollar industry. And we know, everywhere we go, whether we're watching TV, listening to the radio, out and about, the fashion industry spends a ton of money every year convincing us that we need to look like that. And then the fashions change, right? I always said if, that, if, if we could manage to go through our years from, from our young, young adulthood to older age, a few are able to do that, most of us are not, but if you could manage not to put on any weight, if you just keep your clothes, they'll be back in style. The youngest of my three siblings, when he was in high school, he was in to the latest fashion, and boy, was he dressed to the nines. Even going to high school, he went to school every day looking great. And he used to make fun of his older siblings because apparently our fashions, what we were wearing, was already out of date. And so he used to razz us at times. But you know, as the old adage goes, if you dish it out, be prepared to take it because at some point his clothing went out of fashion too. And I told him that one day. I said, hey Bob, one day your clothes will be out of day too. He says, nope, that'll never happen. For his birthday one time, I got him a coffee mug. It said, it's not who you are, it's what you wear. We put a lot of emphasis on what we wear. And actually, in certain places, this is a good thing. You know, if I'm down on Main Street here, and I look down the street, and I see somebody wearing a certain kind of outfit, I know that's a police officer. And that's good, right? Because I may need him or her. When I go to see my doctor, she walks into the room where I'm waiting, the exam room, and she's got a white coat on. I know she's my doctor. She doesn't have to have that white coat on, but that white coat says something, doesn't it? For years, I've put on a robe to preach, or I've got a collar on. Don't have to do that. There's no necessarily reason to do that, but when I do that, I'm reminded that years ago, for some reason, God called me, among other things, to interpret Scripture for a whole bunch of people, and that's important, and I better get it right. Sometimes we wear clothes to make a statement. We've got T-shirts with all kinds of messages or pictures on it. And so clothing really matters. Even if we say, oh, it really doesn't. Yeah, it does. You know, years ago, you might remember, maybe 20 years ago or so, it, it had become um, uh, fashionable, I guess I should say, to, uh, in businesses where people during the week had to dress up in some form. A casual Friday was a thing for a while. I don't know if you remember that. And over time, 
businesses or offices began to, got, begin to get rid of casual Friday because they discovered that in places where the norm was dressing up, when they came to work one day a week casual, less work was done. It's not true for businesses where casual is the norm because you're not changing anything, but where you dress up, then you get to go casual one day, and it just seems that less, less is accomplished. Clothing matters in the Bible. We're told right there in the early chapters of Genesis that Adam and Eve are running around the Garden of Eden naked without a stitch on and they don't even realize it and we're told they're not ashamed. And then they go and do what the one thing God tells them not to do and the first thing they realize is they are outside in the buff. And they quickly run and they grab some leaves and they sew together the first clothing. And then we read later on, God actually makes clothing for them out of animal skins. Remember the story of Joseph in his fancy coat? A status symbol, a symbol of his father's favoritism. Joseph, no doubt, was so excited to have this coat, didn't sit well with his brothers because that coat, that fashion, said something to them that didn't sit well. And then you have, in Israel, David, Solomon, the coronation of kings, because, you know, it's not just enough to be fashionable with the latest clothing. You've got to have accessories. So the king gets a crown and a scepter. We're told in our Old Testament reading, before the kings, that young Samuel... Even as a boy in the, te- in, the, uh, in the tabernacle wore a linen priestly vest and his mother would make a robe for him and take it to him every year. The psalmist tell us that creation is clothed like the sun. And in the New Testament, clothing matters as well. Jesus is born and Mary wraps him, as the King James Version says poetically, in swaddling clothes, strips of cloth, binding him tightly. And that's what we do today to newborns. We wrap them up tightly to help them make the adjustment from the tight, cramped space of the womb out to a larger world. Paul, in our epistle reading in Colossians, also talks about clothing. And he tells us what we wear matters. And he doesn't mean on the outside. One of the images in the early church of character of put, developing character, is to put on clothing, put, put on the clothing of character. And Paul begins in chapter 12, and he says, Therefore, as God's choice, holy and loved, put on compassion. That's the, lang- the language here is the language of clothing. Clothe yourselves, Paul says, with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, in patience. If we go back earlier in chapter 3, we read Paul tells the Colossians first to take off, also to put to death, <laughs> all that stuff that you shouldn't be clothed with. And then he lists all kinds of vices, all kinds of things that we Christians are told not to do. 
clothe yourselves with the character befitting a follower of Jesus Christ. There is an early Christian document, I want to say 2nd, 3rd century, that gives us a little bit of detail about an early baptismal service where on Easter Sunday morning the, the converts would go out with the congregation and they would meet by a pond or a stream be, uh, to be baptized, these new converts. And they would, as the sun was coming up, they would uh, face the west, they would face the darkness, and they would renounce their life of sin. And then they would take off what was a tattered, torn, dirty outer garment, signifying putting off that old person. And then they would turn to the sun as it was rising in the east, and they would confess their faith in the risen Christ, pledge their allegiance to him. They would go down in the waters and be baptized, and as they came out of the water, someone would hand them a brand new white robe that they would put on signifying the new resurrected and transformed life in Jesus Christ. We are to wear the clothing of Christian character. We confess it's a process, don't we? We are going on to perfection or at least I hope we're going on to perfection, as John Wesley liked to say. But, you know, we're not there yet. I'm, I, well, I shouldn't speak for anyone else. I'm not there yet. But hopefully, as time goes on, Paul in Romans gives us the image of baptism as being baptized into Christ's death, taking and putting off of those things for which Jesus had to die for us. And when we come out of the waters, we come out into new life. We're the new person. And Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, commenting on this passage in Romans says, Paul says that in, in baptism, old Adam is drowned. But he says, the problem is, old Adam is a real good swimmer. But here's the good news. If we back up in Colossians to chapter one, or, or chap, verse 1 of chapter 3, we read Paul saying to us, since you have been raised with Christ. Do we notice that? It's not since you will be, as if that's some future event. There is, a, there is a fuller resurrection to come, to be sure. But if, since you have been, since you already participate in this resurrection life, Paul says, live in it now. Live in it now. It's possible to live in it now. And how do we live in it now? Well, first thing we do is we put to death all that bad stuff. And then we clothe ourselves with all the good stuff of Christian character. How do we know what Christian character looks like? Well, the first way we know is we look at Jesus. Because Jesus is the form of the character that God wants us to have. But the second thing all of us know somebody, at least one person, but probably more. All of us know somebody who for us has exemplified this life of Christian character. Maybe they passed on from our midst. Perhaps they're still around. But just by their very life, just by their example, 
they model for us the life of Jesus in the here and now. I thank God for that. I thank God for those persons. Jesus has come. Jesus has been born in Bethlehem. We sing that song at Christmas time, very familiar song, Away in a Manger. And the last verse is very interesting. The last, the last phrase of the last verse is very interesting. Some versions of that hymn end with, and take us to heaven to live with thee there. But there are other versions, and I like this one. Not take us to heaven, but fit us for heaven. Fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Change us, make us different, make us new. You see, the the life of Christian character, we're not left to pursue that all on our own. We're not left to grope in the dark about what that means. But the first thing is we have the power of the Holy Spirit right in us now, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. We get that grace. John Wesley called that at times perfecting grace where God molds us and shapes us. And, and, and we, all we have to do is be willing for God to do that. But through the power of the good news of Jesus, God molds us and shapes us, transforms us, so that we may indeed reflect the character of Jesus Christ to those around us. And so, in this season of Christmas, as we have just started the church year anyway in Advent, and we're going to tell the story all the way around through next November at the end and begin all over again in Advent. That in this time, in this year of worship and reflection and prayer and study in service, we pray indeed that we would be open to the work of God in our lives that we will develop the character of Jesus Christ so that God will fit us for heaven to live with him there for all eternity. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we... Sing the hymn, Have Thine Own Way, that you are the potter and we are the clay. Sometimes it can be hard to be clay. We want to be the potter. We want to make our own lives. We want to forge our own destinies. And yet we know that is not your way. In your love, we pray that you would form us after your will. And may we be yielded and still willing to be what you want us to be. Make us after your will.